Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Robin Madison Harris. I am a senior technical assistant consultant at AIR, American Institutes for Research. Today, we will have our webinar entitled High Leverage Practices Supporting Students with Low Incidence Disabilities in Inclusive Classrooms. Today's agenda will include the following. Welcome and event orientation and speaker introduction. Supporting students with low incidence disabilities. High leverage classroom practices and reflection on application. A facilitated discussion and thank you and stakeholder feedback survey. We will also have two Q&A sessions, so please make sure to jot down your questions or put them in the chat pod. Again, my name is Robin Madison Harris, and I'm a senior technical assistant consultant at, Rel at the Rail Southwest at American Institutes for Research. Our speakers for today will be first, Dr. Tessie Rose Bailey, who is a Principal Technical Assistance Consultant at American Institutes for Research. In her role, she has supported general and special education teachers, university faculty, and leaders in 43 states to implement special education requirements to improve outcomes for students with disabilities. She will be the project director of the new Promoting Rigorous Outcomes and Growth by Redesigning Educational Services for Students with Disabilities, or PROGRESS Center, as well as continue to serve as a special education content expert for several national centers, including the CEDAR Center and National Center on Intensive Interventions, NCII, which will be referenced later on in the webinar. She is also a former elementary and high school teacher of students with high and low incidence disabilities. Welcome, Tessie. Dr. Nicole Pyle is an associate professor in the School of Teacher Education and Leadership at Utah State University in the area of adolescent literacy. Dr. Powell serves as an institute fellow in the Dropout Prevention Institute at the Meadows Center for Preventing Educational Risk. She has more than eight years of experience as a middle school and high school special education inclusion teacher and over 10 years of experience conducting intervention research for secondary youth at risk of academic failure in California, Texas, and Utah. Her research focuses on interventions in secondary education aimed to improve literacy and academic outcomes that ultimately improve graduation rates and college readiness rates of youth at risk for academic failure and high school dropout. Portia Bradford is a teacher at Louisiana Key Academy. Portia studied at the University of Arkansas and graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Education. After she graduated, she accepted a job at Louisiana Key Academy, a public school for students with dyslexia in Baton Rouge. During her four years at LKA, she has taught third and fourth grade reading, writing, and literature, and is currently the English language arts coordinator for fourth and fifth grade. Because of the extensive training she has completed, she has received her academic language therapist certification, as well as the Wilson Level One certification. She has traveled to New York to study expository writing at the Newark Teacher Training Institute. Portia enjoys learning and continuing to study about dyslexia. Dr. 
Growth Southwest works with stakeholders across our region to meaningfully improve student outcomes. We conduct this work in partnership with education stakeholders in five states in our region, Arkansas, Louisiana, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas. We support collaborative research partnerships and conduct applied research in consultation with state education agencies, districts, and other stakeholders that ultimately can lead to improved student outcomes. The Rail Southwest conducts its work primarily through collaborative research partnerships with districts, state education agencies, policymakers, and others in our region. These partnerships focus on high leverage education issues that our partners or others in the field have identified as priorities. Through these partnerships, we work to improve student outcomes by conducting research to advance understanding of education issues, supporting regional stakeholders in building capacity to use data and evidence in education practice, and translating research into actionable resources and tools. Today's webinar is in collaboration with the Teacher, profession, teacher Preparation and Professional Development Partnership. The goal of this bridge event is to discuss effective classroom practices that general education teachers can use to encourage access for students with low incidence disabilities to core curriculum and instruction. The outcomes that we have for this webinar are to increase understanding of the instructional needs of students with low incidence disabilities in a broad sense and the challenges associated with supporting them in inclusive classrooms. Become aware of high leverage practices and their evidence base for supporting students with low incidence disabilities, and gain skills and knowledge to implement three instructional high leverage practices that can be used to teach students in low incidence disabilities in inclusive classrooms. The stakeholder feedback survey will be shared with attendees toward the end of the webinar and also will be sent to all webinar attendees afterwards. This feedback is very important and helps us improve for future events. Our webinar today includes closed captioning. I will use directions to set up closed captioning. If you have any technical issues with closed captioning, please type it in the chat pod and someone will assist you. Our first speaker today will be Dr. Tessie Rose Bailey. Tessie? It's a lot of the things that will be presented today. So please feel free to check out the handout um, and then also check out the chat pod where we'll be posting links to a lot of those resources. So before I get started, I do want to just share a little bit about why we're all here. Um, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which was passed in 1974, was a funding legislation that was meant to provide supports and services for students with disabilities. And the essence of IDEA was to ensure that eligible students were afforded a, a free, appropriate education. And we often hear this as FAPE. Now, FAPE is really the idea that we're providing specially designed instruction at public expense, meeting the standards set forth by the state. 
And those services um, are provided through preschool all the way through their secondary education. What's important to understand is the way that those services are designed um, and sort of uh, put into practice is through what we refer to as an individualized education program. And you may often hear about it called an IEP. Now, IDEA in the early sort of implementation of um, the Act really focused more on ensuring access to students, access to general education for students with disabilities. I'm getting a little bit of feedback from folks. Um, and then in that initial implementation, we focused primarily on ensuring students could get into the classroom, but the idea of educational benefit uh, was really not the focus. And in fact, prior to a 2017 Supreme Court decision, the focus was really on providing pro appropriate progress that was at least de minimis. However, in um, the Supreme Court in 2017 found that in order for LEAs to meet its obligation under IDEA, the school really had to develop an IEP that was reasonably calculated to enable the student to make progress in light of the circumstances of the child, whether the severity of the disability, um, the nature of their learning needs. Um, and in providing those services, we needed to make sure that there was meaningful progress towards individualized outcomes or standards that had been outlined in the IEP. In the case of Andrew, um, the student was a student with low incidence disabilities, um, specifically autism. And in that case, they were finding that the student was not receiving meaningful benefit from the instruction that was being provided both in the inclusive and special education learning environments. Now, we mentioned this idea of low incidence disabilities, and I want to make sure that there's some clarity about what we're, uh, the students that we're talking about. In IDEA, there are three groups of students. The first one are those students who have visual and hearing impairments or in some cases simultaneous uh, visual and hearing impairments that meet this criteria of low incidence, meaning they are, aren't frequently found in schools and they also require a very specialized set of skills from their educators. Um, you are probably thinking most likely the students with significant cognitive impairments, um, students with severe autism or multiple disabilities or even an intellectual impairment. There, this uh, definition of low incidence disabilities also includes a small number of personnel uh, or students who need a small number of personnel with really highly specialized skills and knowledge. Now, as a general education teacher, it's really important that we're collaborating with the, the teachers who have those specialized skills as we begin to implement our high leverage practices. Now, with IDEA, we've talked about this idea of faith. And faith is looking at the way that we provide those services in what's often referred to as the least restrictive environment. Or you may have heard about it as LRE. And IDEA requires that schools and districts ensure to the maximum extent appropriate that students with disabilities, whether they're in a public school, charter school, or private school, are educated to the extent, extent practicable or appropriate with students who don't have disabilities. This is sometimes what we see as this idea of inclusion. And it's important to note that inclusion is more than just the physical location of where a student is receiving instruction. It assumes that students are included in everyday classroom activities and that the practices and policies are in place to identify and remove any barriers, which could be physical, communication, or attitudinal, that are preventing the student from fully participating in that inclusive environment. Now, to support students with disabilities in the regular, regular education classroom, IDEA provides schools and teachers what's referred to as supplementary aids and support. This might be professional development that's for general education teachers like yourself. Um, it could be communication aids, assistive technology, which we'll touch on briefly, the provision of paraeducators, or any other accommodation material that are necessary for a student with low incidence disabilities or any disability to fully access um, the core curriculum that's being provided. 
it's important that general education teachers and special ed teachers collabor collaborate regularly to make sure that you're identifying the student and teacher needs and be able to provide those appropriate aids and services to ensure that teachers feel prepared and that students are benefiting from what is being provided. Now today's session really talks about this idea of high leverage practices. So along with the access to supplementary aids and supports, students will need access to regular education classroom teachers who are equipped to really provide the unique um, learning supports for them to be successful. Now the success of students with disabilities in general education classroom assumes that educators, both special and general education, are consistently using high leverage practices to deliver evidence-based instruction and practices. Now what are high leverage practices? They're really the practices that are sort of the essence of teaching. When carefully carried out skillfully, these practices in, increase the likelihood that the teaching will be effective for the student learning. They're useful across a broad range of subject areas, grade levels, and teaching contexts, and are helpful in using and managing the differences that you find with students in your classroom. Now, as I mentioned, high leverage practices are applicable across the everyday of teachers' work. Um, and so it's not just something that we use in the core classroom with a certain group of students. It's actually used across the, the various levels of support. So if you're an MTSS, it could be a Tier 2, Tier 3, um, as well as in special education. The other thing, as I mentioned, is they cut across domains and grade levels. So whether you have a student with low incidence disabilities in your math class um, or your reading class, we're going to see practices that are consistently used across those domains to really get to the outcomes that we're trying to achieve. So that frequent use of these practices, um, regardless of the, the content or the, the type of student or the grade level, is really what helps us get to our outcome. Now we know that these practices are supported by research and policy, and that's why we've selected three of those um, that will be shared with you today. Now in the chat box, you'll see that there are a number of great resources that have been made available to you. If you check out the handout, um, you will see all of them listed with the hyperlinks so that you can access them. Um, but the first one I want to share is uh, one of the two leading resources or sources for high leverage practices. It comes from Teaching Works and it outlines 19 essential practices that all teachers need to know to deliver effective instruction. These really are, if you look at the practices, are essential to what define us as teachers. Now, most likely you're doing a lot of these practices in your day-to-day -day teaching. So if you look on the right side, I mean, think to yourself, do you ever explain and model content, practices and strategies? Do you set up and manage small group work within your classrooms? Do you build respectful relationships with students? And you're probably doing all of these, but sort of the essence of a high leverage practice is that we're doing them consistently across domains um, with equitability across our students. Now these practices here are what we see all teachers need to know to teach any student. Now we know that in some cases when we're working with students with more significant needs, like those with low incidence disabilities, we know that we need much more specific practices to help those with the unique needs. So the Council for Exceptional Children, in collaboration with the CEDAR Center, and you can find a link to that in the chat box, um, have developed a set of practices that are applicable to both pre-service and in-service that can help us positively impact the students, the, the needs of, sorry, the impact the outcomes of students with disabilities when they're being served both within general education and special education settings. These practices are divided into four main categories. Collaboration, which is really the practices where general education and special education teachers work together to identify how they can best provide supports and services for students with low incidence disabilities. The second set of practices really are looking at the assessment is that what are the data that we're using to determine whether the student is making appropriate progress 
in light of their circumstances? And that are we really identifying and addressing the particular needs? The third set of practices focus on the social, emotional, and behavioral supports. And we know that many students have these needs, but in some cases, students with disabilities have more specialized needs. And so collaborating, we can use high leverage practices for students with disabilities to address those. Today's session will focus on three of those high leverage practices that come from the last category, which is instruction. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the practices not addressed today, I highly recommend checking out the resource High Leverage Practices in Special Education, which is uh, the images on the left-hand side. And you can find the link in the chat box as well as the handout that's there.